Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX14 and Walsh and welcome to an all new Ace in a Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode, by the special request of my father, I shall be reviewing the Whirlwind Mark 1, a tier 3 battle rating 4.7 British Heavy Fighter. As always, starting with the plane's history, we shall be covering the Westland Whirlwind from its inception through to its operational service. We begin thus. With the potential attack speeds of combat aircraft ever increasing over the course of the 1930s, the British Air Ministry recognised that greater attack speeds warranted less time on target, thereby favouring aircraft armed with multiple cannon. As a result, in 1935 the Air Ministry issued specification F-37-35 for a single seat day and night fighter armed with four 20mm cannon. The plane also had to have a top speed of at least 531km an hour or 330 miles per hour at an altitude of 4,572 metres or 15,000 feet, so it could outrun contemporary bombers. Multiple designs were submitted in response, some being single engine, others being twin engine. West of them submitted their P9, a heavy fighter powered by two Rolls Royce Kestrel K26 V12 liquid cooled engines which would be housed in underwing nacelles. When the designs submitted were reviewed in May of 1936, the Air Ministry felt that whilst the twin engine design would be less manoeuvrable than a single engine design, this was outweighed by the possibility that the mounting of the cannon in the wings of the single engine designs would lead to uneven recoil, making it difficult for the pilots of these potential aircraft to achieve accurate fire. Hence the decision was taken to pursue twin engine designs that had the cannon housed in the nose. However, Westland's P9 was not the first choice. Instead, the Air Ministry initially pursued Supermarine's 313 design due to the promise shown by their Spitfire fighter, which was undergoing trials at the time. Yet with Supermarine's efforts heavily concentrated on the Spitfire, the Air Ministry quickly reversed this decision and opted instead to pursue four designs, Westland's P9, Supermarine's 313, and both Bolton Pool's P-88A and P-88B. The P9 would take priority, with the Air Ministry placing a contract for two P9s in February of 1937, expecting them to be available for testing by the summer of 1938. Led by William Edward Willoughby Petter, the Western design team refined the P9 design to use the latest technology available. The fuselage would be tubular, with a T-style tail unit to accommodate the airflow over the tail unit which resulted from the deployment of the plane's Fowler flaps. The cockpit was elevated and featured a bubble-style canopy to improve the pilot's visibility, situated behind a long nose assembly which would accommodate four 20mm Hispano Mark I cannon with 60 rounds per cannon. The plane's engine nacelles would be occupied by a pair of 885 horsepower. Rolls Royce Peregrine Mark I V12 liquid cooled engines. Interestingly, in terms of its overall size, the P9 was only slightly larger than the contemporary Hawker Hurricanes. The changes made to the design and the low availability of the specified engines led to the initial prototypes, designated L6844, inaugural flight, being delayed until the 11th of October 1938. This flight and the plane's subsequent test program yielded highly positive results with the plane being able to reach speeds in excess of 579 km an hour or 360 miles per hour, matching the contemporary single-engine fighters. This led to a production order for 200 whirlwind aircraft, as the design was dubbed, being replaced in January of 1939. The first production aircraft were delivered to 263 Squadron under the designation Whirlwind Mark I, i.e. the plane seen on screen today, starting as of the 6th of July 1940. By December of 1940, the squadron had been fully equipped with the aircraft. Despite not participating in the Battle of Britain, which concluded on the 31st of October 1940, the plane's potential deficiencies were revealed as the battle had shown that both altitude and speed were the key factors in fight to combat. Whilst the Whirlwind's performance was strong at lower altitudes, it waned considerably with increase in altitude. The potential to further enhance the plane's peregrine engines for high altitude performance was limited, especially with Rolls-Royce's Merlin engine being the focus of development and the engine having proven itself in the Hurricanes and Spitfires that took part in the Battle of Britain. Moreover, plans were already in motion for cannon-armed Spitfires by this time, meaning that the role the Whirlwind had been originally designed for would soon become obsolete. Instead, an alternative role had to be found for the Whirlwind. It was initially proposed that the Whirlwind could be used as a night fighter, yet it was quickly found that the Bristol Bue fighter was a more suitable candidate for the Air Ministry's night fighter requirements. A temporary measure was to use the Whirlwind for both shipping operations and short-range bomber escort missions over the channel, with these deployments proving relatively successful. The final, definitive role for the Whirlwind was its usage in the high-speed, low-level cross-channel rhubarb and roadstead sorties from mid-1941 in the hands of squadrons 137 and 263. 
The plane was enhanced for this role in the summer of 1942, where it'd be impossible to equip the Whirlwind Mark I with underwing bomb racks to carry either two 113kg or 250 pound bombs, or two 227kg or 500 pound bombs. These converted fighter bomber aircraft were designated as Whirlwind Mark IIs and soon received the nickname Whirly Bomber. The Whirlwind would continue to be applied in this fighter bomber role up to the 29th of November 1943 at which point the aircraft was replaced with the Hawker Typhoon. In all, despite production being cancelled in January of 1942, a total of 112 production aircraft had been produced as Whirlwind Mark 1s, with 67 of these planes being converted to Whirlwind Mark 2s. And so, with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the Whirlwind Mark 1 handles in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the airfield domination map Kark and Goal, for this will be used in the following setup. Stealth belts are a 20mm cannon, the reason being in my experience, the stealth belts are the most powerful out of those available. As for our gun convergence, we've got it set to 500 meters. this is the standard setting I like to use for guns which are mounted in the nose and therefore not convergence reliant. And as for our fuel load, we're taking this standard 30 minute fuel load to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscathed on fuel capacity. As always, open up with the climb rate of the plane, in the case of the Whirlwind Mark 1 for its batter rating, in my opinion it's average and has great sprinting potential. In that, with your attacker spawn straight from the start giving you a slight altitude advantage over the single engine fighters that spawn in at a lower altitude, you can combine your ability to gain 2000 meters altitude in a single sprint at a 25 degree climb angle with war emergency power cycling as shown here, and that attacker spawn to give you the ability to get to the higher altitude regions of the sky at roughly the same time as the best climbing single engine fighters at the batter rating. These include the likes of the Spitfire Mark 16 and the Messerschmitt 109G2. And from that point onwards, if they're isolated, you can start to take them on in one-on-one -on -one engagements and be rather aggressive in doing so. If you want to take a more sustained approach, I'd recommend a climb angle of 17 and a half degrees. But remember, your rate of climb is going to be slower, albeit through war emergency power cycling. In this instance, you'll be able to gain between 3,000 and 4,000 meters altitude in a single climb before you'll need to level out. And that's because you have the ability to hit your maximum altitude limits rather early, and perhaps one of the weaknesses of this plane. In that, at 4,500 meters altitude, heaviness will be added to your elevator control service, causing your turn circle to widen, and it'll make loops much longer and much wider as a result. Whereas at 4,750 meters altitude, your engine power will begin to drop off in terms of acceleration, and above 5,000 meters altitude, you'll really feel it in terms of climb rate as well. But we're not going to be going up to that point because this is an airfield domination game where the higher altitude threshold really is in the region of 4,000 meters in my experience and instead we're going to charge towards a Messerschmitt 109 G6 who's just a little bit underneath us and continue to climb. If you want to be aggressive here, try to use our cannon power in order to take them out in the head head or dissuade them and force them to go underneath us. As we go into a gradual dive here, we're anticipating they're going to use a split S to try and close the gap to us as we break away, which is why we're continuing our gradual dive here, using our average dive speed acceleration all the way up to 750 km an hour before we experience a massive drop off in dive speed acceleration. And in return, as we go to higher and higher speeds, the 19G6 breaks off thinking they're not going to catch us, but we'll catch them instead for a yo yo on our elevator and rip them apart for our first kill. And we saw that how we applied the fact that our elevator has no lockup at high speed in the dive to our advantage in being able to cleanly snap back on the foe. As we go for a reload at this point, note that between most engagements I will be going for a reload because you have a limited ammo capacity of 240 rounds, and what these cannon demand in precision, because they're all located in the nose in a tight fashion, which means there's very little variance of where the rounds go, it's very easy to find yourself running out of ammunition if you haven't taken a reload between engagements when you've got a foe cleaning your gun sights. Hence why I want to make sure I'm always going into the engagement with 240 rounds available. And as for call for 90 now diving down us, we're going to be using the same tactic of building up speed in a high speed dive, because we can never achieve our below average maximum dive speed of 849 km an hour. That Focal for 90 a will be able to out dive us in terms of maximum dive speed. But what we can do is retain the controls of our elevator and instead force them to build up a lot of speed to lock up their control surfaces and for a set of vertical scissors force them to overshoot and now use our tight looping circle while it's having one of the better looping circles for our batter rating as long as we're using our elevator above 375 km an hour. We've got a tighter loop circle in the Focal for 90s we face, an equivalent one to the Messerschmitt 109Gs that we'll face, and slightly better than the equivalent of the Yak 9s we'll see, just as examples there, in order to reverse the engagement against the Focal for 90 and pick up our second kill. Now, the reason I stipulate 375 km an hour is because that is the start point of the ideal speed range of this plane. Below 375 km an hour, what you'll find is that this plane's elevator instantly starts to become heavier. Once you go below 350 km an hour in particular, you'll find that doing a loop takes an extra 50% of the time. 
and as you go further and further down in speed, at 200 km an hour you'll start to experience stall effect, taking you all the way down to your stall speed of 145 km an hour, which is above the average for your batter rating. But we can see we're using our stalling capabilities here with our stall recovery being okay, our nose dropping rather fast, to force the Messerschmitt 410A1U4 to stall out and we'll come around on them to rip them apart for our third kill. And just finishing off the stall recovery discussion, if you stall at say 50 degrees in terms of climbing angle, what you'll find is that the nose is going to drop fast, your speed will need to build up to 250 km an hour before you regain control of your control surfaces, but you will not lose too much altitude, no more than say 150 meters altitude. Now we'll switch into the interceptor roll to bring down a Halifax and then a B-17, going for a reload in between so we only need a single pass. Now coming back to the control surfaces, what you'll find is, whereas well, we've talked about the elevator being the best control surface of this plane so far, and you'll need to start your loops by the way at 290 km an hour plus, otherwise you're going to stall mid loop, the roll rate and the rudder should not be underestimated. Your roll rate is average and better than you perhaps expect compared to the other heavy fighters that you'll encounter at the batter rating. But between 700 and 800 km an hour, you'll lose 25% of its performance, which is not too much of a problem, because your average dive speed acceleration means it's very difficult to trigger this speed threshold in the first instance to limit your roll rate in a boom and zoom attack, so do not be worried too much. I mean, with regards to your rudder, as we bring down the B-17 here, what you'll find is it's average and gives you a decent flat rudder turn circle, which means that hammerheads are rather comfortable, but more importantly you can add this rudder into a standard turn, where your turn circle being average of combat flaps already, just slightly wider than likes the LA-7B-20, and that gives you the capacity to turn just that little bit faster and take unsuspecting foes by surprise they're expecting this heavy fighter to lumber around in the skies. And they'll be particularly doing so because they'll be used to turn fighting against the likes of Messerschmitt 410s and PE2s which do have significantly wider turn circles than this plane. And for its batter rating it's got one of if not the best turn circle for the heavy fighters. Now outside of turning with our position and the control surfaces now we're going to start using this plane in boom and zoom strikes, and we do have to keep in mind that the energy retention of this plane is average in the vertical. In that in a dive, where you go from say 4000 meters altitude and a starting speed of 300 km an hour, you'll be able to, in a 90 degree dive and then coming out at a 30 degree return angle, return to your original state over a 1350 meter dive on engine power alone, or 1850 meters with more emergency power. So this isn't going to win any accolades of boom and zoom potential, but it's still half decent as we come down the Spitfire here and we'll carry through to a Wildcat here to pick up a double strike and our final two kills for this game. But it should be kept in mind you do have that boom and zoom potential. But more importantly, once you break out, say for example here you take down two foes and then you find someone's hot on your six, do you have the straight line energy retention to get away? Well, with that much Smith Wild 9 hand broken off, we've only got to worry about the Hellcat and you do have the ability to retain a good amount of energy and it's above average for the batter rating, in that you'll be able to retain your speed at roughly 530 km an hour. But where we've lost a lot of our speed here is through the fact we've been zigzagging left to right, we also made that exaggerated roll, and that's where you lose the speed in running in a straight line. And once you've lost that speed, you have the difficulty to continue to build it up, because your straight line acceleration is okay, but this plane is not exceptionally fast. On engine power, you're alone, you'll go from stall to 370 km an hour at a decent rate, and then there is a gradual drop off in acceleration, peaking really when you try to go above 475 km an hour, if not 500 km an hour. With all emergency power active, you've got a fast acceleration all the way up to a threshold of 440 km an hour, and then there's a gradual drop off once again. But really, pushing above 500 km an hour takes a long period of time, and that's in compliance with the straight line energy retention hitting that cap of 530 km an hour and you need to fly dead straight to get the most out, so that's previously mentioned. In terms of the horizontal energy retention, that's where this plane is strongest for energy retention, in that you'll bleed speed in a dedicated turn with no flaps active until 390 km an hour. With combat flaps, you'll drop this threshold to 365 km an hour, and with landing flaps, 290 km an hour, which means you can use combat flaps and landing flaps sparingly in order to be able to maximize your turn circle. But remember your ideal speed limit no less than 375 km an hour. You go below that point, your elevator starts to lose its performance, and that's the key control surface here. But the two go hand in hand, in effect, you have to keep them in mind and evaluate each engagement. And that's one of the key things you'll note throughout the course of this entire gameplay it's that careful planning of which strike to make next, which attack to go for, which engagements to go for. We're trying to space out engagements, we give ourselves ample breathing room, and at the same time, we're able to build this plane into its ideal speed range, if not above it, to be able to utilize our elevator in the first instance. Now what about durability, because we have taken a number of hits on the left hand side of the plane, in the inner portion of the left hand wing in particular. Well unfortunately the durability of this plane is poor as depicted by the brief damage we took, in that your wing fuel tanks, of which you have four, two in each wing, are vulnerable and can burn the plane down very quickly. 
and I've only been able to survive two out of roughly 15 fires that have been set to this plane so far, one of which was from rifle caliber machine gun arm from a biplane. Your wingtips are fragile as well. If they come flying off, then you need to instantly reduce your speed below 300 km now before you can use the elevator, otherwise you're going to be forcing this plane into a flat spin very quickly. Alternatively, the flaps will come flying off on one side and that will destabilize the plane quite heavily. And on top of that, do keep in mind that your engine isn't exposed, what with them being housed in separate nacelles rather than into the wing itself. And that means if they take damage, it's normally critical damage to one engine. And whilst you can fly home on a single engine, you'll practically lose all of your combat effectiveness. And last but not least, because the cockpit is elevated above the central fuselage, that means your pilot's quite exposed to being knocked out, particularly when you're attacked from above and behind. We go head to head with a Spitfire there, but it's to no avail, our ally picks them off just before we get the shot on target, but nonetheless we're grateful for that foe being dispatched, and that's really going to wrap up the game at this point. As we now break off back to the safety of friendly spawn, the game ends and it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. By deploying our Whirlwind Mark 1 in a variety of roles over the course of this match, starting off as a rather aggressive fighter, then an interceptor and then moving into more of a boom and zoom or hit and run strike fashion, we're able to pick up 7 kills, netting us 27,917 silver lions and 2,552 research points. Now whilst not extremely visible, there's one key theme to note about how we try to use this aircraft throughout the course of the game, and that is in terms of our altitude placement. As the ideal altitude range of this plane is between 1,500 and 4,000 meters in my opinion, where as you go above 4,000 meters altitude, you start to encroach upon your maximum altitude limits as described, starting at 4,500 meters with the control surfaces. Conversely, once you go below 1,000 meters altitude, you'll find that your climb rate starts to fall off slightly, but you still get the majority of the performance out of your engines, particularly in terms of straight line acceleration. So wherever possible we try to aim to keep within that region of 1,500 to 4,000 meters to get the most out of our aircraft, and I think, fair to say, we did so successfully for the course of this match. When facing the Whirlwind Mark 1 in a one-on-one -on -one engagement, I can recommend one or two approaches to defeating this aircraft. When flying a monoplane fighter, I'd recommend turn fighting with the Whirlwind. Reason being, whilst the Whirlwind's turn circle is average for its battery rating, it is undermined by the plane's elevator becoming heavier below 350 km an hour. By applying this weakness to the situation, the Whirlwind's turn fighting capability can be quickly reduced. Triggering this weakness will not be possible for a standard turn due to the Whirlwind's strong horizontal energy retention, which allows the plane to hold its speed in the turn, with combat flaps active at 365 km an hour. Instead, I suggest using a climbing spiral, I climb as you turn. This will soon cause the whirlwind speed to drop below the 350 km an hour threshold. At this point, the plane's turn circle will widen, equaling that of the weaker turn fighters at its battery rating, such as the P-51D-30 Mustang. If the whirlwind continues to try and follow the climbing spiral beyond this, they will eventually be forced to level out as their speed will continue to drop. This will present you with the opportunity to use a hammerhead to attack them from above. Alternatively, if the whirlwind breaks off on the climbing spiral, this will give you the chance to come around on their six. The alternative approach would be to attack the whirlwind from above via a boom and zoom strike, with the aim of launching the attack from an altitude of 5,000 meters or higher. This approach is applicable to all aircraft, but to its heavy fighter opposition, such as the Messerschmitt 410B1U2. Reason being, the performance of both the whirlwind's engines and controls will have dropped off notably by 5,000 meters altitude, discouraging them from pursuing the higher altitude regions of the sky. Meanwhile, the vast majority of its opposition will retain at least its engine performance up to 5,500 meters altitude, if not 6,000 meters plus. Additionally, the whirlwind's lack of top speed means that you can safely use the edge of the battlefield to gain altitude with ample warning if the whirlwind is on its way to intercept you. Upon conducting your boom and zoom attack, you'll typically only need one clean hit to bring the whirlwind down due to its lack of durability. If you miss, you can always retreat back to the higher altitude regions of the sky, as the whirlwind will have difficulty in following you due to its maximum altitude limits. To wrap up, let's first recap the strengths and weaknesses of the Whirlwind Mark 1. Its main strengths are number 1. Tight Loop Circle Whereas the loop can typically be used to gain the upper hand on a heavy fighter when flying a single engine fighter, the Whirlwind Mark 1 breaks this trend, with its loop circle at least matching, if not surpassing, the majority of its single engine fighter opposition. Number 2. Decent Firepower As long as you are accurate, the 420mm Hispano Mark 1 cannon of the Whirlwind can quickly bring down any opponent. The fact they are mounted in the nose adds to this, giving the plane the ability to down aircraft out to 1.5km via head-on strikes or long-distance pursuits. And number 3. Versatile 
Whilst there will be multiple aircraft at its battery rating that are best in fulfilling a particular role, the whirlwind can be deployed in a variety of roles, for example interception, boom and zoom, last shoot turn fighter, etc, subject to the situation. This is due to the combination of its control surfaces, engine performance and firepower. As for its key weaknesses, number 1. Demanding ideal speed range. If deployable at its ideal speed range of 375 to 500 km an hour, the Whirlwind Mark 1's elevator will underperform, holding back the plane's combat potential. Moreover, keeping the plane within this speed range during an extended engagement can prove difficult, allowing opponents to easily exploit it. And number 2. Poor durability. In general, the Whirlwind Mark 1 will react poorly to taking hits even from light caliber machine gun armament. If the wing based fuel tanks are not ignited, causing the plane to burn out of the sky, then you will typically see the engines receive damage parts of fuselage break off, or your pilot being knocked out. As for my final opinion of the aircraft, the Whirlwind Mark I bucks the trend for the heavy fighters in its battery rating range. Whereas most are focused on using their considerable firepower to intercept bombers and bring down unsuspecting fighters in a single pass, the Whirlwind can be deployed in a wider variety of roles. This is subject to its speed being kept within its high ideal speed range, which can prove difficult and necessitate a more considered approach to selecting engagements. However, if one is able to manage this requirement, then they will be sure to always end up finding a role for the whirlwind. With that, that is all I've got time for today. Since this was a specially requested review and not part of my planned review sequence, the aircraft to be discussed in next weekend's review will be based on the poll between the SM-91 and the F-2A-1 Buffalo as mentioned at the end of last week's review of the RE-2001 Serie 1. Link will be available in the end credits. But as always, I've been TX141, if you have enjoyed this video why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. And until next time ladies and gentlemen, as always, take care and good luck in the skies.